Debate 40 here. There's so much in life that we can't control. I talk about reality being the big, blooming, buzzing confusion that I'm just here sharing my delusions while you share your delusions. But there are things that we can control. We can essentially control our wage rates by controlling immigration, and we can control our crime rates by cracking down on people who do really bad things. So more to come. Let's check in with Tucker Carlson. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Good night, everybody. Two days before the Democratic Senate primary in Pennsylvania back in May, staffers for the John Fetterman campaign announced that their candidate had tragically suffered a stroke. But no problem. In a written statement purportedly written by John Fetterman himself from the hospital, Fetterman announced that he was absolutely fine. I'm feeling much better, the statement read. Doctors tell me I didn't suffer any cognitive damage. Okay, so the primary continued as planned with Fetterman's name on the ballot, and Fetterman won. He became the Democratic nominee. And that was the last that most voters heard about John Fetterman's stroke. For months, Fetterman remained in semi-seclusion. Then as the campaign progressed and the polls tightened, he began to venture out. He had no choice. And video clips surfaced of Fetterman speaking at rallies in what seemed to be a bizarre and highly disjointed way. Some began to wonder if he'd really suffered, quote, no cognitive damage from his stroke. It was at this point that Fetterman's personal physician, a man called Clifford Chen, who also happened to be a campaign donor to him and other Democrats, rushed forward to bring science to bear on this question. In Clifford Chen's considered opinion as a respected medical professional who works at a major research university, John Fetterman was absolutely fine. Fetterman was, quote, recovering well from his stroke. He had, quote, no work restrictions and can work full duty in public office. In other words, John Fetterman was as sharp and as healthy as you or me, as anyone in America, in fact, more so, ready for the Senate. Fetterman's wife, who presumably would know, seconded this assessment and attacked anyone who disagreed. So did a group of Democratic office holders who wrote a piece in the Huffington Post about how their own strokes had only enhanced their public service. A stroke? No big deal. It's a good thing, actually. Ought to be a prerequisite for service in the Senate. For their part, most of the reporters who covered John Fetterman day to day worked hard to calm concerns about his health. Is John Fetterman a silver-tongued wordsmith? No, they conceded. He never has been. But brain damage? Come on. Don't be a bigot. That's ableist. Until last night, that's pretty much where things stood. Some people, mostly Republicans, thought John Fetterman might not be mentally fit to work in the Senate. Others, mostly Democrats, agreed with Clifford Chen, his doctor, that Fetterman was absolutely fine. So it was a neat partisan split. Then Fetterman appeared on stage for his first and only debate and settled this question for all time. John Fetterman, it turns out, is not capable of driving a car. He should not be allowed to operate a microwave oven. There is no chance that under any imaginable circumstances, John Fetterman could, quote, serve in the U.S. Senate. It's not a close call. Watch. You're running for a seat that could decide the balance of power in Washington. What qualifies you to be a U.S. Senator? You have 60 seconds. Hi. Good night, everybody. What? So that was the moment right at the top that you know this was not a debate like the debates you'd seen before. Most debates feel pretty scripted. And in fact, this debate actually was scripted. John Fetterman had a script. He was reading it, but he was still incapable of following that script. Here, for example, is how Fetterman responded to maybe the most obvious question of the night, one he knew was coming and, of course, would have prepared for. Here's his answer. You're saying tonight that you support fracking, that you've always supported fracking, but there is that 2018 interview that you said, quote, I don't support fracking at all. So how do you square the two? Uh, I, I, I do support fracking, and I don't, I don't, I support fracking, and I stand, and I do and support fracking. Okay. So a lot of conclusions here. The most obvious, why is Clifford Chen still practicing medicine? If you're a physician, are you allowed to lie for partisan reasons? Don't we have enough of that in this country? Should doctors be allowed to do that? He clearly was lying. That's not a man who can work with no restrictions in the U.S. Senate. Far from it. 
And everyone watching, every honest person, would come to that conclusion. We could play you a lot of clips like that. You've probably seen them already today. But not everyone is an honest person. And to prove it, we're going to show you how MSNBC covered this dis debate the moment it ended. Here is New York Magazine's Rebecca Traster. Clearly, this was a candidate who was feeling stress, and there was such intense scrutiny, often ableist scrutiny, on how he was going to communicate. And he just did a debate in front of, a, you know, a, the nation, a, you know, an audience of anyone who could listen. And it was so transparent. He did fumble. He did make verbal mistakes. Um, you know, the, and, and it was all on view. But, the, the, you know, I think it's also really interesting. You played a lot of clips. There were moments where he was really strong, including that Bernie Sanders clip, yeah. including his very fluent and direct response on raising the minimum wage, I thought was a really strong mo moment. So we just keep clips like that around just for future historians to assess what went wrong in America. And we wanted the hackiest possible response the most dishonest assessment ever offered of any public event, and we just played it for you. He was facing ableist scrutiny. <laughs> because we're literal and we can't control ourselves, you just heard her say that Fetterman had a strong answer to a question. Talk about patronizing, by the way. Well, we thought we'd go and check what was his answer. You can assess for yourself whether this was, quote, strong. Here it is. What do you say to small business owners who have told us that if the minimum wage were increased to $15 an hour, it would put them out of business? You have 30 seconds. Now, we, we all have to make sure that everyone that works is able to, that's, that's the most American bargain, that if you work full time, you should be able to live in dignity as well, true. And I believe they haven't have any businesses being, being, uh, you can't have businesses being subsidized by not paying ind uh, individuals that just simply can't evade to, to pay their own way. Okay, again, we could fill the hour recapping John Fetterman's sad responses. But it's not really that surprising to anyone who's been following John Fetterman for the past five months. You knew that he was profoundly cognitively impaired, and it turns out he is. So you learn really not that much new about him. What you learn is that everyone around him, from his doctor to his wife, to the media, to the Democratic Party, they're all liars. And they all just got caught lying. The debate went on and on and on like this. During Dr. Oz's closing statement, Federman began shouting uncontrollably about Social Security until the moderator hushed him. Really, look it up. The effect over an hour was to make you feel very sad for John Fetterman. This is humiliating. The guy looked exactly like Billy Bob Thornton in the movie Sling Blade. He really did. He couldn't even read the canned lines his staff was writing for him. It was pathetic. You do wonder about his wife, as you do about Joe Biden's wife. It seems cruel to do this to a man, even for political power. But again, it's the media who cover John Fetterman who should be the most ashamed. They've known the truth for months with only one exception, that would be NBC reporter Dasha Burns, the media lied to voters about it. We don't know anything about Dasha Burns, but she at least tried to be sort of honest. Here's what she said after meeting John Fetterman. You'll hear he also still has some uh, problems, some challenges with speech. And I'll say, Katie, that just in some of the small talk prior to uh, the interview, before the closed captioning was up and running, it did seem that uh, he had a hard time understanding our, our conversations. Oh, that's not allowed. So here you have a young reporter who clearly doesn't know the rules. No matter what you actually see or experience or report, you can't reveal anything that might hurt the fortunes of the Democratic Party, that might slow down the team. So clearly Dasha Burns hadn't gotten that memo. And for daring to say that, for honestly reporting what she saw, liberals tried to destroy her. Rebecca Traster again of New York Magazine said Fetterman, quote, is not at all impaired. He understands everything. Molly Jung fast said she spoke to Fetterman and quote, he understood everything I was saying and he was funny. <laughs> Podcast host Kara Swisher, this is like the this is like the worst people on social media, wrote this on Twitter, quote, 
Sorry to say, but I talked to John Fetterman for over an hour without stop or any aides, and this is just nonsense. Maybe this reporter is just bad at small talk. Blame the girl, will you? Kara Swisher, of course. And then Charlotte Alter of Time Magazine, whatever that is, also interviewed Fetterman recently. She knew perfectly well he was incapacitated. They all did. But Charlotte Alter decided to cover for John Fetterman because supporting the Democratic Party is, of course, her job. In the hours before the debate, Charlotte Alter did the bidding, the direct bidding of the Fetterman campaign by trying to lower expectations. That was their goal, and she worked on their behalf. Quote, Fetterman has never been a good debater. Alter added, quote, everyone will be watching for Fetterman's stroke symptoms. I can tell you already what they are. He sometimes says the slightly wrong word or conjugates something the wrong way. <laughs> okay. They're not embarrassed. They're caught working for a Democratic Senate campaign and they just shrug it off and keep going. They never slow down. So once Fetterman got on stage and there was really kind of no lying about it, he humiliated himself. The usual chorus piped up, not to admit that they were wrong, but to say, yeah, he's demented, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that he's totally incapable of thinking or speaking. Why? Because abortion. Abortion is more important than anything. Because it's not a child sacrifice cult at all. No, it's not. Don't worry. In response to a post stating the obvious that Fetterman is totally impaired, a lawyer at the Democratic Party's main firm, Perkins Coy, sent this Stalinist tweet, quote, his ability to protect a woman's right to choose is not in doubt. This is a harmful tweet. Delete it. <laughs> Delete it. Abortion's too important to note the obvious. Senate Democrats tweeted effectively the same message after the debate, quote, Mehmet Oz is a grave threat to a woman's right to choose. John Fetterman will fight to protect abortion access nationwide. That's their response to a guy who is literally incapable of talking. So what do we learn from this? We learn a couple of things. Most obviously, it tells us that abortion is more important than anything else. Abortion is what really matters to the left. And if you doubt that, consider the case of 89-year-old Dianne Feinstein, who supposedly represents the country's biggest state in the U.S. Senate. At this point, everyone in Washington knows Dianne Feinstein isn't representing anyone. She's no longer capable of recognizing old friends. And in April, the San Francisco Chronicle, to its credit, ran a story in which former staffers, not political enemies, but registered Democrats who voluntarily worked for Dianne Feinstein, in which these people, her friends, described Dianne Feinstein's mental decline and said that she was too senile to serve in the Senate. So in response to that, Nancy Pelosi dismissed their firsthand accounts as, quote, unconscionable and ridiculous, not just wrong, but immoral. In other words, shut up. Dianne Feinstein is on our team, and that's all that matters. To emphasize that point, yesterday, Kamala Harris went on a tirade, not about inflation or housing prices or fentanyl deaths or the border or the looming nuclear war with Russia, but about the thing that matters most to her and all of them, which is abortion. Watch this. Laws that are being proposed that would punish women who dare to exercise self-determination and make decisions about what they know to be in their best self-interest because apparently there are some, I call them extremist so-called leaders, who have decided they're in a better position than she is to make decisions about what's in her best interest. How dare they? I think that we need to take back the flag on this issue. This is about freedom and liberty. Oh, it's about freedom and liberty, says the childless middle-aged lady who forced women across the country out of their jobs because they wouldn't take the vaccine that she was pushing on them. Suddenly it's their body, their choice again. Right. Barack Obama cut an ad for John Fetterman just a few days ago. He's not ashamed to do that. His argument, of course, abortion again. Watch. In Pennsylvania, you've got some important choices to make this year, including who represents you in the U.S. Senate. That's why I'm asking you to vote for John Fetterman this election day, November 8th. So when the fate of our democracy and a woman's right to choose are on the line, I know John will fight for Pennsylvanians. You can count on John Fetterman. Make sure he can count on you. So it all goes back to that one issue. It always does. Why is that? We're not exactly sure, but it's hard not to notice that it does. But there's something bigger going on here. 
Fetterman's candidacy, like Joe Biden's candidacy two years ago, tells us something pretty dark about the Democratic Party. What it tells us is the Democratic Party has such contempt for voters and for democracy itself, and so much confidence in its ownership of the media and of big tech, that it no longer has to try to win your votes. Democrats can run Raphael Warnock, an aggressively anti-Christian, fake Christian pastor whose wife detailed abuse allegations against him on camera, and that's okay. It's still good enough for a Senate seat in Georgia because the machine keeps working. It's not about the person, it's about the party. It's not about the individual, it's about the group. And to prove it, they can even run mentally defective candidates who can barely speak and not only expect them to win, but expect you to accept the outcome no matter how transparently absurd it is. On November 9th, they'll be telling you that John Fetterman got 81 million votes in Pennsylvania and they'll threaten to put you in jail if you don't believe it. Why wouldn't they do that? They work with Joe Biden. Glenn Greenwald is an independent journalist. His work is on Substack. He joins us tonight. Glenn, thanks so much for coming on. There's something about the unwillingness of people to acknowledge the obvious. If there was a candidate whose views I really liked who had a performance like that, like Fetterman's performance, I hope I'd be honest enough to say, you know, I agree with the guy, but that was disqualifying. There's something about the unwillingness to admit what everyone knows is true that, oh, it's, it's chilling. It's, it's scary. Yeah, I think it's a form of power. You know, so often George Orwell was so prescient in what he predicted about how authoritarianism and tyranny would work. And in 1984, the novel we all read in high school and his warning about how authoritarianism would happen, he described a tyrannical party. And he Oh, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Tucker. All right. So much in life we don't get to decide. So much of life is confusing. So many variables, so much complexity in life. But there are two fairly simple things. We can choose our wage rates, all right? By stopping immigration, all right, we will command much higher prices for labor, particularly for unskilled labor. We can dramatically increase wages for construction, for people at the lowest socioeconomic uh, point in the ladder, just by stopping immigration, right? Just say, okay, stop. We're going to enforce immigration laws. We're not going to allow people to come here illegally. And all those amazing dreamers that we keep hearing about, that we keep getting berated about how wonderful they are, well, turns out that they're not so incredibly wonderful. They're just average. So for their entitlement, and Quarter says they should be ejected first. So if we kick out people who are here illegally and prevent people from coming here illegally and stop immigration, we can dramatically raise wage rates for the average American. And we can reduce rents. We can reduce home prices by cutting off immigration, right? We can make life so much better for Americans by cutting off immigration. That is within our power, right? We can stop immigration and we can raise wages, right? We can make life better for regular Americans, right? That's something that, that we can do. It's not terribly complicated. It's not like there are just so many damn variables. It's just such a, a buzzing, you know, complicated thing that we'll never be able to figure out, you know, gee, what does the London School of Economics have to say about this? And has Harvard done a study? No. Government sets wage rates by determining immigration rates. Our government has decided not to protect the border and to allow massive immigration. And so in Southern California and in California in general, construction wages have not gone up in 50 years. In 50 years, they have not gone up. Construction, all right? An, an industry that provides tens of thousands of jobs in California. Wage rates have not gone up. They've not gone up in Texas or, or Arizona or the Southern United States for 50 years because we have unlimited amounts of immigration. And if the government says stop, we're not going to allow in any more immigrants, then construction wages will go up. Janitorial wages will grow up. In Australia, you have farms offering to pay people $45 Australian, which is, what, about $30 American. $30 American an hour to pick mangoes, right? As, as a 16-year-old, you can pick mangoes in Australia for $30 American. 
and they have a hard time finding workers because Australia does not allow in illegal immigrants. The Australian government protects its borders. They are quite discerning with who they allow to immigrate. And so as a result of government policy, Australia is the best country in the world to be an average bloke, to be an average person, right? Australia is the best place in the world because government has designed it that way. In the United States, government has designed it that uh, America is not such a great place to be an average person. Right? It's a great place if you're above average. Right? If you're above average in intelligence, you've got an IQ north of 100, and you happen to uh, have friends and family and, and community, and you're, you're mentally stable, yeah, then America is a great place. But for, for the lower half of our socioeconomic spectrum, America is not such a great place because we allow in so much immigration. So we can just change that, right? It's not terribly complicated. Stop immigration, you raise wages, you raise standards of living, and you make a better country for Americans. Now, another thing that we can simply choose to do, and that is to enforce the law and to crack down on crime. Right? If we enforce the law, if we follow the country's direction through the 1980s into the 1990s, we can slash crime, right? It's simply a matter of putting the 1% of our population who commits a disproportionate amount of crime, particularly violent crime, we can just put them behind bars on the first offense. We can slash crime rates. We can drive them back to 1950s levels. We can create a safe America where your wife could walk to the grocery store at night in Los Angeles or New York City or in Washington, D.C. It's not terribly complicated. We know what works. We've done it before, all right? We crushed crime in this country. So our rising crime rates over the past 10 years are a choice. Excellent op-ed by former Attorney General, Attorney General Bill Barr in the Wall Street Journal. Rising crime today. rates are a policy choice. Progressives can't solve the problem because they won't abandon the practices that cause it. By William P. Barr. October 26, 2022, 12.18 p.m. Eastern Time. The violent crime surge was preventable. It was caused by progressive politicians reverting to the same reckless revolving door policies that during the 1960s and 70s produced the greatest tsunami of violent crime in American history. We reversed that earlier crime wave with the tough anti-crime measures adopted during the Reagan-Bush era. We can stop this one as well. Studies have repeatedly shown that most predatory crime is committed by a small, hardcore group of habitual offenders. They are a tiny fraction of the population, I estimate roughly 1%, but are responsible for between half and two-thirds of predatory violent crime. Wow, I wonder who is this 1%? Like, wouldn't it be good to, say, get some representative photos? Wouldn't it be nice if we, we say, studied physiognomy? Because the little we have studied this, we know that uh, serial killers do tend to have like disproportionate uh, facial scars, and uh, there are some telltale signs of people who are much more likely to be murderers than other people. Perhaps we should study this. If the, the majority of our violent crime comes from just 1% of the population, then uh, maybe we look, should look into that more. I mean, that seems to me to be, be a uh, worthy, worthy topic for study. This is a Fox News Alert. How are things going in America's biggest state, California? Well, Fox's Matt Finn has new video that tells the story. Hey, Matt. Hey, Tucker. This shocking video shows a 65-year-old woman terrorizing a family and smashing the windows of their new home with a pickaxe. You could hear that chilling sound. Fox 11 reports the owner of that home said the woman had no emotion and was just swinging away at their house that they have not finished building. She can be heard saying, I'll be back, get out.
And the homeowner says his six-week-old baby daughter was sleeping in a bassinet just beneath one of the windows. But luckily, his mother-in-law grabbed the baby away from a window about five seconds before it was smashed in. That man says the shards of glass from the giant window that were falling were double the baby's size. Pasadena police arrested 65-year-old Beverly Baker. She faces a charge of felony vandalism. The owner of the home says... He owns several properties in the area. He's never seen this woman before, and he worries he was targeted because he's Armenian. That man says he got a temporary restraining order. This woman's in great shape for 65. I mean, I don't agree with what she's doing, but she looks good. She's active. I mean, she's enthusiastic. I mean, she, she could make someone a good wife if she just, you know, cuts back on the, you know, the axe vandalism. Order against that woman, Tucker. Amazing. Sad. Matt Finn, thanks so much. Thanks, sure. Matt. So why was it so important to every power center in the United States to prevent Elon Musk from taking over Twitter? Lots of billionaires own media organizations. In fact, most media organizations are owned by billionaires. Why was Elon Musk, who's not some kind of right winger, so threatening? Because he promised to bring free speech back to social media. And that's the one thing they can't tolerate, period, because their entire rule is predicated on censorship. Bloomberg recently reported that U.S. officials, Biden officials, are considering investigating Elon Musk on national security grounds. But apparently Musk was not intimidated. Today he walked into Twitter headquarters in San Francisco carrying a sink. He shot a video with the caption, entering Twitter HQ, let that sink in. <laughs> apparently by tomorrow night, Elon Musk will own Twitter. This is a big story bigger than we can even fully understand probably at this moment. Darren Beatty of Revolver News has been thinking and writing about this for months now. He joins us tonight to give some perspective on it. Darren, thanks so much for coming on. So what, why is this a bigger story than your average billionaire buying your average media outlet? Well, Elon Musk has the potential to be a great man of history, and he has stepped outside of his designated role as glorified IT support for the regime. And he stepped into a very dangerous, high-stakes arena for a cause of civilizational importance. The question of whether we have free speech on what he calls a global public square is indeed of civilizational importance, and it's an existential threat to the crooks that control our regime. And in fact, it's such a threat that I predict if he goes through with this and it does implement free speech on Twitter, Elon Musk and Twitter will be designated, in effect, the number one national security threat to the crooks in control of our regime. So Twitter is more than just a venue for people to spout off about politics. Twitter is used by foreign governments, by our own government, yes. in the information wars. Is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about bots, and bots aren't just automated uh, things promoting the latest cryptocurrency scam or even bots of foreign intelligence agencies. The truth is, our intelligence agencies operating usually through cutouts and NGOs have played a huge role in influencing politics on every level precisely by gaming the system and social media platforms like Twitter. And Elon Musk, I think, really needs someone who understands the architecture of that censorship. There's an example, probably the greatest national security leak since Snowden, of how the censorship regime works. We talk about it on a recent piece at Revolver News that's available now. It's called the Integrity Initiative. But the social media apps are replete with these types of operations. In fact, one woman who attacked Elon Musk for threatening to restore free speech on Twitter was involved in an app, in an operation setting up fake Russian accounts so she could blame an American politician for enjoying support by the Russians. And so you really need to understand how deep this goes and how dark this is. Bringing transparency to Twitter, how it works, what exactly is the algorithm, will change everything. I, I agree with you. I think this is civilizational, and I appreciate that perspective. Darren B. Thanks, Darren. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
So the question is, can you whip out your genitals on live television? Well, it depends. Are you doing it in the name of trans rights? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> That's what went on on the BBC. This uh, guy in the name of trans rights uh, whipped out his genitals on uh, live TV. It was, it was an important moment. So very exciting. Musk looks set to take over Twitter Friday. Can't wait. All right. We can determine our crime rates. There's only about 1% of the population who's doing the majority of the violent crime. The nasty predatory crime, right? It's committed by a small hardcore group of habitual offenders, about 1% of the population responsible for most predatory violent crime. Each of these offenders can be expected to commit scores, even hundreds of crimes a year, frequently while on bail, probation, or parole. The only time they aren't committing crimes is when they're in prison. For this group, the likelihood of reoffending usually doesn't recede until they reach their late 30s. Lock them up. That's what I say. Lock them up. All right. After you, you know, swing one pickaxe into someone's window, sending shards of glass over a bassinet, I say lock her up. Lock up the thugs. Lock up the super predators. Let's do it. Let's make America great again. This American carnage stops right here and right now. The only way to reduce violent crime appreciably is to keep this cohort off the streets. We know with certainty that for each of these criminals held in prison, there are hundreds of people who aren't being victimized. This incapacitation strategy requires laws, like those in the federal system, that allow judges to... So Laponia says 6% of the American population is in prison. Pro, Google it. It is 0.7%. We need to up it to at least 1%. Come on now. Check your facts, bro. Tain repeat offenders before trial when they pose a danger to the community and that impose tough sentences on repeat violent offenders. History shows this strategy works. Before 1960, violent crime in the U.S. was modest and stable. In the early 60s, however, liberal reformers pushed to turn state justice systems into revolving doors, with violent offenders quickly released on parole or probation. Predictably, violent crime exploded, going from 160 crimes per 100,000 population in 1960 to 758 per 100,000 in 1991. In the 1980s, the Reagan administration... Right, that's a, a six times increase in violent crime. Right, that's a massive increase. Right, lock them up. Lock up the super predators. Throw away the key. Administration and several large states started locking up violent offenders, and the nation's prison population rose from about 300,000 to almost 700,000. This radically flattened the rate of violent crime, which rose only 11% during the 80s. By 1991, when I first became attorney general, the revolving door was in overdrive in many states. Nationally, murderers serve less than six years on average. The average time served for rape was three years. In Texas, the average murderer served six years. How ridiculous is that? Uh, the, the average rapist, like violent rapist, three years. We're talking rape, rape. We're not talking date rape. We're not talking rape. We're not talking regret sex. We're talking violent stranger rape. Get three years. Murder, the average murder in the United States got six years. Offenders typically served only 15% of their sentences. Five of eight felons released from prison were arrested for new crimes within three years. Right, so about two thirds of felons released from prison were rearrested for new crimes within three years. Right, people who went to prison in Texas on average served 15%. Of their sentence. That's ridiculous. We got to get tough, guys. We got to get tough on the border. We got to get tough with criminals. We got to stop incentivizing bad behavior. We got to stop subsidizing bad behavior. Instead of giving, giving, giving to the homeless, when we pass them on the street, we should be spitting on them to incentivize them to clean up their act. Right? I I'm all for volunteering. In, in an appropriate agency that knows what it's doing, right, so that you can actually do some good for the homeless, but just giving them money, right, just giving them handouts only encourages their antisocial behavior. We've got to start punishing people who act in an antisocial manner and 
blessing people who act in a pro-social manner. Like right now, we're just shoveling money and resources at people who behave abominably, people who are disgusting and filthy, who are wrecking our streets, who are wrecking our communities, who are just sucking on the welfare tent. All right? The more money you pay out in welfare to single mothers, the more children they have out of wedlock. Ridiculous. I mean, you are to the live and let live ethos. You probably never expected to see full frontal nudity on American television live, but now you are for political reasons. Of course, Fox's Trace Gallagher has that story for us tonight. Hey, Trace. Hey, Tucker, this full frontal performance appeared live on Channel 4 in the UK on a show called Friday Night Live. It was a transgender comedian named Jordan Gray, born a male, now identifies as a female. Gray got notoriety being the first transgender comedian on The Voice back in 2016, but on Friday night, Gray, wearing a bright pink suit, decided to end her performance, saying that on live TV, she gets to do stupid stuff like this. Watch. Plays the piano with his dog. He plays the piano with his dog. So the show got 1,400 complaints. There were people irate and offended, and a UK television watchdog is now deciding if the performance should be investigated. But in all of the newspaper coverage of the naked dance that we read, there was not one, not one negative comment printed, zero criticism. In fact, Metro News UK raved about the naked dance, calling it hilarious, groundbreaking. Really? Playing the piano with your penis, groundbreaking? At least when Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky back in his comedy days was in a skit where he played the piano with his penis, he only gave the illusion of doing so. You know, he pretended. Watch. That skit was recently dug up and put on Twitter with one person saying, quoting, who among us has not played Hava Nagila on the piano with their genitals on stage and then gone on to lead their country against a foreign invasion? That, Tucker, might be groundbreaking. Back to you. I, as, as so often happens, you have left me speechless. <laughs> Trace Gallagher, Thanks, now Trace. the full-time host of Fox News at Night, right here Midnight Eastern, absolutely the best. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Trace. A few days ago, 30 House Democrats did something, well, Democrats often used to do. They sent a letter to Joe Biden urging him to consider negotiating a peace between Russia and Ukraine before more Ukrainians and Russians, for that matter, die, and before there's a nuclear war that destroys all human civilization. Seemed pretty reasonable. But it made the Democratic Party's donors furious, including the defense contractors. So immediately, these so-called progressives retracted their letter. Then they blamed it on staff and said it was all a mistake. So what is this really about? What is this support for Ukraine really about? It's not about democracy, because Ukraine's not a democracy. Of course, not even close to a democracy. They banned opposition parties. Well, Jamie Raskin, one of the original signatories on the letter and a member of Congress from Maryland, kind of let the whole game out. He issued a statement praising the diversity of Ukraine's army and affirming its war against Putin's, quote, anti-feminist, anti-gay, anti-trans hatred. I discussed this yesterday. What? What does that have to do with anything? Well, it has everything to do with it, of course. Jamie Raskin added that we must support Ukraine against Russia because Russia is the, quote, homeland of replacement theory for export. Whatever that means. But it's about domestic politics here, of course. You knew that. Meanwhile, California Congressman Eric Swalwell just got back from kissing the ring of Senior Zelensky in Kiev, or as he calls it, Kiev. He says we need to give Ukraine everything it wants or else, and this may come as a surprise, Russia's going to invade the United States. Watch. If Kevin McCarthy is going to be beholden to this America first mindset that we're not going to send a penny to Ukraine, uh, then... You could see the morale in that country collapse. Ukraine's fight for democracy is our fight for democracy because history has shown that Russia will not be satisfied if they just take Ukraine. They'll keep pushing west and we will be drawn uh, personally into this conflict. So beating them now uh, saves us from having to fight them here or fight them much closer later. Just to be clear, there are only two borders that matter. 
the border of Ukraine and the border around the U.S. Capitol. Both are sacrosanct. The border of your country, you don't have a country. Tulsi Gabbard is a former presidential. Okay. Wow. That just kind of takes your, your, your breath away. By the way, Ukraine is a democracy, right? Just because it has large amounts of corruption doesn't mean it's, it's not a democracy. All right. Back to this stunning op-ed in the Wall Street Journal by former Attorney General Bill Barr. The George H.W. Bush administration initiated the doubling of federal prison capacity, pushed states to do likewise, and launched a broad movement to toughen up state justice systems. It also greatly expanded joint federal, state, and local task forces to target the worst violent criminals for stiff sentences under federal gun, gang, and drug trafficking laws. The results of these policies were stunning. By 1992... Right, there are some things we don't know, all right? We, we may not know whether or not lockdowns were a good idea. To my understanding, on average, on balance, the lockdowns were a good idea, but I understand that there's, there are good arguments in both sides. But we do know what will crush crime, and that is locking up super predators, locking up the violent predatory 1%. As more violent offenders were incarcerated, the trajectory of violent crime started falling for the first time in decades. Presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush continued these policies, and from 1991 to 2013, the total prison population in the U.S. doubled, from roughly 800,000 to 1.6 million. At the same time, violent crime plummeted, dropping for 23 years. By 2014, it had been cut in half, to a level not seen since 1970, and homicides of... Wow, Tulsi Gabbard looks great, and we don't have enough people in prison. We need more people in prison. Let's put the super predators in prison and let's send people who are here illegally out of the country, including the dreamers, and toughen up our borders and stop allowing in immigrants. Black victims were down by about 5,000 a year. Nevertheless, progressives complained, why were we imprisoning record numbers when crime was receding? They missed the point. Crime was dropping precisely because we were keeping violent criminals in prison. It's so simple, all right? You let violent criminals out of prison, the odds are 70% plus that they will commit violent crime again within three years. So keep them in prison and throw away the damn key. Progressives call this mass incarceration, but their rhetoric is deceptive. It implies people are being locked up indiscriminately. On the contrary, incapacitation is a precision strategy. It targets and uses prison space primarily for violent criminals who pose the greatest threat to public safety. Unfortunately, 23 years of successful crime reduction came to an end with the resurgence of progressive policies in the Obama administration, which saw a return to the revolving door and the demonization of police. Incarceration rates started falling again, and by 2014 crime rates were headed back up. This reversal was temporarily halted by the Trump administration, which succeeded in driving violent crime down until the summer of 2020. It started to climb in the wake of the COVID pandemic and the Black Lives Matter riots. It continues to rise without any end in sight. Progressives have no solution. As in the 60s, they call for more social spending to address the supposed root causes of violent crime. Yeah, we've had these calls for 60 years, more social welfare spending to address root causes, and it doesn't work. Locking up of violent criminals, that's what works. But even if we knew how to address the root causes effectively, which we don't, implementing the solution would take decades. People are entitled to protection now. Even the best designed social programs have no chance of success in neighborhoods strangled by violence and fear. Law and order is a prerequisite for social progress. Progressives say we can't afford to keep violent predators in prison. On the contrary, we can't afford not to. A 1992 Justice Department report, the case for more incarceration, showed that the cost of keeping a chronic violent criminal in prison is small compared with the cost of letting him roam the streets. That's right. We, we, there's a lot of conversation about how much it costs to keep people, you know, violent criminals locked up in prison, considerably less than it costs to allow these people to roam free and, you know, beat people up, murder people, rape people, destroy. I mean, the... the implications, the staggering costs that uh, just skyrocket when you have violent criminals on the loose, just the dramatic reduction in quality of life, people pulling in, staying home more to watch TV instead of participating in wider society, it just uh, 
Violent crime is the number one problem in America and has been for 60 years, and we know how to fix it. You lock up super predators. In other contexts, we spend huge amounts to reduce the risk of premature death or injury to members of the public, including billions on highway safety or environmental quality. If we started using the same cost-benefit analysis for law enforcement, we would be spending many times more than we do today on police and corrections. The very purpose of government is to secure a peaceful society, making life safe for law-abiding citizens by protecting them from violent predators. Progressive politicians are doing the opposite, blighting the lives of the law-abiding with their warped solicitude for the criminal few. We can stop the swelling crime wave only by rejecting these politicians and their destructive policies. It is time for a return to sanity. Well said, former Attorney General there, Bill Barr. All right, lock them up. Lock up the super predators. All right, here is uh, Richard Spencer talking about Alex Jones. In fact, you have the right to be wrong, obviously. So, you know, you're not, you could, uh, I don't know, if someone is murdered, you could speculate that about that online. Oh, I think it was uh, his uh, business partner. And if you aren't, you know, maliciously trying to demean this person, that is, I would imagine, covered by free speech, but just maliciously disregarding the truth and claiming that, you know, Jim Bob Womack, he actually, uh, he murdered his wife or whatever. If you're doing that without any evidence or any semblance of reason, then you are defaming him maliciously, particularly if you have a motive to do it. I guess Alex Jones's motive was to uh, just, you know, isolate a target and then get his fans whipped up into a frenzy and uh, profit off that, just create a kind of team uh, that is, you know, on to the truth and things like this. I, I can see it. And I, I can see how Alex Jones did absolutely engage in defamation. And, um, you know, a billion dollars, that seems a bit much. But, you know, there's no doubt if you put yourself in the shoes of these people, your um, this unspeakable crime has occurred that affects you personally. And then you have some blowhard online saying that you and George Soros were engaging in some elaborate scheme to take away gun rights. I mean, I can totally understand that that would have caused hurt, heartache, sleepless nights, depression, outrage, etc. So I get it. Um, and I think with Alex Jones, it's hard to defend him in this instance. But I don't think the conservatives are completely wrong when they suggest that they're going after him because he is the grand pooba of conspiracy theories. And even though this started before Trump, there, you know, that's kind of thrown into the mix. And it does become a kind of political and culture war. And I think that's true. It does have the feel of that, even if like the technical legal um, qualities of this are, are something else. Now, obviously Alex Jones does himself no favors. He has apologized, I guess, but then he'll unapologize in some way and he'll attack the judge. I mean, he's, it, it seems like he's suicidal or he's just, making it worse and playing up the fact that he's a victim when in fact this is an actual law <laughs> this is not some you know again I, I i'm not denying the political quality to all this but it is a law in the book so you got to get real here but yes it is a culture war as well but i guess what i was thinking about this is that um you know we have these and this this is something that certainly affects me personally and a great comment in the chat. Why is Alex Jones responsible for what his viewers supposedly do? But Grand Theft Auto is not responsible for what its players do. And rap music isn't responsible for what its listeners do. Good points. Now, as you can imagine, Richard Spencer is going to bring this topic back to him. As well, it reminds me of the Charlottesville case. Uh, I was never arrested uh, during Charlottesville. I might have, I don't know, preferred to have been arrested on some level uh, because it would have taken me out of that situation safely uh, and not, uh, you know, I, I actually did escape Charlottesville um, in rather dangerous circumstances. But putting that aside, the way that people tried to prevent another Charlottesville was to create this massive burden that a Damocletian sword that hangs over everyone's head, which is that we are going to sue you in civil court for something. And we've got the big gun lawyers, you idiots are going to be, you know, impoverished, you're going pro se, and we're just going to crush you. It is this, this civil, I mean, again, this is a, what Alex Jones went through, what I've gone through, it's a civil matter, it's not a criminal matter. I was never arrested. I was surprisingly uh, never investigated or asked, I think I was asked to participate in the Heapy report and I declined. I actually kind of regret doing that. I, I would have preferred to have participated actually, because the Heapy report was um, very good and very serious, but I also wasn't subpoenaed. And he, uh, I don't know if he could have done that or not. Maybe he could have. Uh, I actually regret not collaborating, but um, you know, when you go and talk about a situation, you are kind of putting yourself in jeopardy. But anyway, that's not a good one there. Heapy report was good without me and it didn't involve me. 
But what I'm saying is this, this use of the civil court system in order for, for people to pursue things that are ultimately political. Obviously, the Charlottesville case was outrageous and completely political or ideological or personal, however you want to describe it. This one a little bit less so with Alex. I'm having I'm kind of struggling here to defend him, as you can tell. But Okay, but what's the alternative to allowing people to try to hurt people through the civil court system? The alternative is that uh, people will hire people to break people's legs. All right. So the the court system is a way for people to let off steam to go after people uh, short of criminal violence. So, yeah, I, I think it's better that people get to sue people rather than hire people to, you know, break someone's legs or, God forbid, kill them. There are just serious problems to the use of the civil courts like this for political ends. Everything gets to be politicized, right? There's no escaping. If you tick off people, they will hurt you. If you hurt other people, they will hurt you back. So... There are ways to minimize your odds of getting sued. You can be an honest person. You can be an upright person. You can communicate clearly. You can document everything. You can avoid making face false promises. You speak and conduct yourself responsibly. You take into consideration the effect of your words and your deeds on other people. And if you do that, you dramatically reduce your chances of getting sued. I, I mean, Richard Spencer behaved so irresponsibly for so many years it's a wonder that he wasn't sued more. And on some level, I would just appreciate... And, and I was sued five times for libel. And a large part of that was a certain recklessness on my part. So I'm not coming from a holier-than-thou perspective that, you know, oh, I'm so above it. Until I got into 12-step programs, I was a little bit out of control to moderately out of control to way out of control. But once you start taking into account the effect of your behavior on other people, then you reduce your odds of getting sued. Appreciate an actual speech code. <laughs> and I've made this argument about Twitter and social media, which is that why don't they... Sued on what grounds, Mr. Ford? I was sued for libel and slander for my blogging on the porn industry. And uh, I won virtually all my cases. Just literally tell us what we can say and what we cannot say. Wouldn't that just simply be better? And you, you do see a little degree of that. I don't, I think on... Right, th but that's childlike. You know, wouldn't it be better if they just told us what we could say and, and, and not say? If they could just make it all simple? No, you have to take into consideration the effect of your choices on other people, right? And, and not just reduce things to an iron law. If I do this, then that's forbidden. But if I do that, it's okay. What's okay and what's not okay often changes day to day. You have to be alert to the world around you. You have to be alert to the effect that you have on other people and whether other people are being damaged by your words and your behavior. Twitch, you kind of can't use any um, ethnic slander or whatever. So I, I think, some, you know, like Hassan got suspended for a week for using Cracker. And I, I think he used it in a circumstance that I don't think would really offend anyone. But they stuck to their, you know, the letter of the law, the letter of the TOS. And I actually appreciate that in a way, not just because Hassan is horrible, but because I would prefer just explicit codes. And as opposed to... Yeah, so Twitch has more explicit codes, but YouTube still has considerably more freedom of speech than Twitch. I mean, I, I've given up even having an account on Twitch. It's just ridiculous over there. The idea that you're going to sue someone into oblivion. The civil court wasn't meant to be used in this way. And there's an interesting case. Let me find it here that actually picks this up. So this is New York Times versus Sullivan. What a state may not um, constitutionally bring about by means of a criminal statute is likewise beyond the reach of its civil law of libel. The fear of damage awards under a rule such as that invoked by the Alabama courts, this is when the New York, Alabama was prosecuting the New York Times, by the Alabama courts here may be markedly more inhibiting than the fear of prosecution under a criminal statute. The judgment awarded in this case without the need for any proof of actual pecuniary loss was 1,000 times greater than the maximum fine provided by the Alabama statute for criminal libel and 100 times greater than, uh, than that provided by the Sedition Act. And so this took place, this case, uh, which actually came about in this so this is such an incredibly childlike attitude here here by Spencer. He wants everything, you know, covered very specifically by legal codes. But legal codes can't cover everything in life. All right. There is extra legal morality. There is there are extra legal social dynamics. There are extra legal ways that you can devastate people. You can devastate people with the full consent of the law. That doesn't mean that they're not going to seek retribution against you. So Times change, what's permitted changes. And if you are 
striving to be honest with people, forthright with people. If you document what you're saying and doing, if you don't make false promises, if you're not running cons and deceptions on people, and if you are not needlessly hurting other people, you significantly reduce your chances of getting sued. To the civil rights struggle, 1964. What it's saying is that, let's say you had actual speech codes. And so, you know, they, there was a criminal code on the books. They're not going to, like, a, there's no fine that's going to be a billion dollars or something like this. And wouldn't you rather, in a way, pay a thousand dollars and go to jail for a month? Than yes, yes, th that would be nice if everything was just all made clear. Th that would be so nice, but reality does not work that way. Right. The reality is if you hurt other people, they will hurt you back. Reality is the best way to conduct yourself in life is to act and speak as though everybody knows everything. Now, do I fully live up to my own standards? No, I don't fully live up to my own standards, but that is a standard that I strive for. I essentially strive to conduct myself in a manner where I'm taking it for granted that everybody knows everything. I'm not trying to run a con. I'm not trying to get away with stuff. Bush era conservative. And he got on Fox and he, again, he, Fox, let's say kind of like, it was like Glenn Beck Stoltz is the cause of that. Okay, I think this so. Is um, I, I remember back Glenn Beck. in, I guess it was 2008 and Alex Jones was complaining about Glenn Beck uh, because he was like, Glenn Beck stole my shtick. And Glenn Beck was on Fox News at that point. And Glenn Beck had been a goofy and kind of, let's say kind of like troll friendly. I, I don't say that to be insulting or snobbery or anything, but you know what I mean? A kind of troll friendly version of neoconservative Fox News. Like he was on board with the terror war. He actually got at CNN headline news, I believe for a little bit and was just an off the shelf Bush era conservative. And he got on Fox and he, again, he did adopt that persona where it's like, you need to know this information. I'm going to tell you who the puppet master is. And he, he literally used that word. The puppet master was, you know, bum de bum, you know, or dum de dum, <laughs> George Soros. They stuck with the same thing. And, but he also had that, you know, disheveled, I'm just a normal guy and the scales have been lifted from my eyes. And I see all of this stuff. I need to pass on this information to you. And I am honest and guileless and genuine, but also kind of, what's the right word? Uncouth or like, I, I'm just a normal man. And I've got to tell you this information because they want to kill your family. Uh, a kind of Mr. Smith goes to Washington effect. I think that is, if you can embody that persona that you can make your way in conservative media. And also conservative media will kind of always take your side. I mean, one thing I noticed um, not to get too kind of bitter and personal here, but one thing I did notice <laughs> between like comparing myself and say Nick Fuentes is Fox News, although I was mentioned by name by Tucker Carlson, but uh, Laura Ingram would always make a point of, we don't know who he is. Who is this guy? We have no idea who he is. Well, and um, they would not defend me. And they would go with some line of like, he's a secret Democrat or he's, he's a Marxist. I, I've heard it all. Um, I, Nick Fuentes did get support because he was presented as guileless. And I don't know if that's the best word, but you understand what I'm getting. He was presented as an innocent babe. And so they were like, he's just this young kid. He's a Zoomer on YouTube. How could you get mad? Well, actually, Nick Fuentes knows exactly what he's doing. Nick Fuentes is actually rather sophisticated in what he does. And he knows how to grab you. He knows his audience. He knows how to pander and so on. He wasn't just some kid who like randomly hit the record button on a camera and then threw it up on YouTube for no reason. I mean, he obviously has a sophisticated agenda of some kind to be a media personality. He's far and more dishonest than like a true... <laughs> alt-right type person like even yeah. kind of admits it with how he talks about optics it's like yeah. about infiltrating the gop um i don't know he's like openly just about, subversive. Just about. <laughs> yeah but he obviously uh, knows what he's doing yeah he is sophisticated there, there are these kind of weird layers like i don't again i don't think it ultimately works but that's just my opinion it, it obviously has worked for what he's tried to do um and at least in the medium term uh but the way he was defended like michelle malkin who again doesn't have much of a uh, profile anymore she used to have a huge profile but she, her defense of him was not like like if you want to defend Richard Spencer or Ed Dutton or Mark Brahman or whatever, you, or like Mark Weber or whatever, you would have to say something like, well, you know, we, you know, they have the right to be wrong and uh, you need to confront them intellectually and not physically, or they, they would have to make some kind of claim like that. But the claim about Fuentes was he's just an innocent child. <laughs> you know? It's like he rolled out of the crib and he accidentally hit mom's camcorder and he recorded a monologue and then dad accidentally uploaded it to YouTube. And there it is. This guy doesn't know what he's doing. He just cares about America. You know, it's this <laughs> patronizing. Okay. You may wonder why does Richard Spencer sound a lot saner these days? Like what the hell is going on with Richard? And it effectively says that a company cannot be sued for the comment section. Effectively, you are a platform and not a publisher. And so the New York Times can be sued for libel, uh, but Twitter cannot be sued for libel when an anonymous account goes on there and says, you know, the moon landing never happened. And, um, you know, Kurt is a well-known 
homosexual in Australia. That, of course, wouldn't be libel because it's true. And, you know, so, but uh, put, you understand, yeah, you understand what I'm saying here. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, if they take that away, I have no idea how the internet could operate. Like, I am totally in agreement with Jack Dorsey when he says, like, this would be Armageddon. You, you would have to have extreme, intense uh, moderation. Every platform that, would be Alex Jones. Right. And so, like, dollars. but why are they talking about this? T Ted Cruz is talking about this because it's like, we can take this away from you and just screw over Twitter. So it's just pure malice. Hmm. There's no, like, I have not, outside of, like, a pure libertarian who wants everything to be decentralized and just wants no so why is Richard Spencer sounding so sober these days? Benefit to the big platform or whatever. I, that's at least I can understand that argument. But like from any reasonable perspective, there is no case to be made. So all you are doing is basically saying, we're, we're just going to like put a stick of dynamite under Twitter and light it. And it's just kind of like, all right, you're just, you're just malicious. You know, you're not adding anything to discourse here. You're not adding any policy. You're, you're just being a complete jerk. Uh, and, you know, I don't know. I mean, in terms of some of the policies, like in Texas and Florida, the, I think one, the Florida one was overturned by the Florida Supreme Court. The Texas one was upheld. And I believe the Supreme Court is going to look at this. Talking about social media um, laws in oh, yeah. Florida and Texas. All right, I'll have to finish my, oh, it's 830. Yeah. What guys? You want to make the gingerbread? You're getting sleepy. I can tell by your voice. All right, guys. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to leave the call on. Um, I'll just make, uh, I'll make Magnus the. Okay, I must not have had the, the timestamp uh, correct, but uh, Richard says that he stopped drinking, right? So maybe he drinks once a week. So he's considerably dialed back the drinking, and as a result, he's become a lot more sane. Reich or Russia or China. Uh, Richard, wouldn't you say that, I know it's not a big priority to you or something that animates you or you feel strongly about, but wouldn't you say just as a decent human being, you care a little bit about the, about the Palestinians being brutally oppressed unjustly? No. No, uh, I don't understand that. Why? I care more about my dog, and I do about. <laughs> I know more. I know more, animals. but but can't you? You don't even have like a basic basic human decent level of empathy for it. No. <laughs> no. I don't understand. Give a shit about them. What do they give to the world? Their shit. What do they give to the world? Jesus Christ. Their shit. I don't give a shit about them. They should. If they. If they. If That's an important point. Like, what has your people given to the world? What does your group give to the world? Like, how is it in? the national interest or the world's interest to care about you and your group. So, they're so like sad about being oppressed. Maybe they should fight harder. Stop being pussies. I don't I think they really fight hard enough. Zero respect or sympathy towards losers. I don't, I don't think they're pussies. I just think they're outgunned. The Israelis have US supply hard Why is that? Why is that? Because, because of who, who, Well no, I mean who runs the US? <laughs> I just do not give a shit. And they so, can actually like there are ways to be smarter and you know do things so that you have allies in the world and stuff like that. I mean they I don't know. I kind of agree with Terry Kushner. Like, they're just, I don't know what can be done with them. And they're not going to, like, take our side or something. And I just believe in reciprocity. The movement, uh, the pro-white movement, has a long history of being supportive. So, and so it doesn't really rabbi, care about the Palestinians. I mean, that's the King James Bible version of a confounding language. Confusion, creating multiple tongues, creating ethno-nationalism, you could say. Creating Talking lots of different the Tower of Babel tribes, story here. Kind of making us misunderstand one another through the lack of a precise language. And, you know, something like Latin is nothing if not precise. They hate that. That is what they hate. They, they, Talking the about Holy Jews. Bible is invariably directed against any kind of, I'll just say it, white supremacist empire on this planet. That is what it is directed against. It is not about keeping, like, you can't be a victim or it's not fair. You can't stick up for your friends and neighbors and your people. Or, no, they don't want a power that is separate from them, that does not obey Yahweh, and that is reaching for the stars. Yes. Okay. So you don't and believe that the, is the motivation of Paul. That is the motivation of Jesus Christ, who is anti-Pharisee. That's true. Um, Anti-Roman. That Paul is outright anti-Roman. And Dylan, Paul, Dylan, let's hold on. Just like, so we should just learn something from that and kind of understand what the Bible is telling us, because you have to respect the Bible. You can't just be a fedora-wearing atheist and say the Bible is stupid and silly and religion doesn't matter. Okay. You know. Good luck with that. This is <laughs> this is a the Pentateuch inform. I mean, what, how many Christians are there on the planet? So there are 2 billion Christians on the planet and Richard Spencer wants to create the Antichrist. Over I mean, how, billion, how, 2 billion. Over, yeah, there, there's like, let's just use raw, rough numbers here. The 2 billion, there's like 800 million Arab Muslims. Or, I mean, I, yeah. yeah, and then there's like, I don't know, there's 6 million Jews in Israel and 6 million Jews in America. Like 12 million, 18 million total. 15, 15 yeah. million. There's 15 million Jews yeah. total. Okay, so we're, we're using rough numbers here.
Um, you know, maybe I'm overestimating, say it's all but 7 billion people on the planet, but you know, I, I'm not far off. It is the most influential thing in the world. By far, it's not gonna be debated. It is so powerful. It is about your, the fate of your soul. It is about what you think makes you a good person. This is their power, morality. Okay. So Colin, what were you gonna say? Again, you have to I look at that. And I am, I mean, I, I don't know. We, I mean, I don't wanna to be too like aggressive here, but like what I ultimately want to create is, a, is, is an anti-Christ, so to speak. And I mean that like very liberal, excuse me, very literally. It is yeah. going against, it is the, something that is the opposition of Christ, not, not a kind of, I'm not talking about revelations here or something like that. I'm not talking about in-time prophecies or anything. I'm just saying like, we need to start creating a morality that is in opposition to the morality given to us by the Pentateuch. Okay, he wants to create the Antichrist. That's, uh, that's an edgy idea there from, from Richard. Richard, he's never not interesting. You know, I, I do think that, I mean, Christianity is kind of this, this fusion um, of that, I think. I, I think that's how I would square it. But, you know, to, to be honest, I, I really don't know at this point. I'm, I'm still trying to kind of put these pieces together. Um, you know, I would say this does contradict, I think at, at the face, it might contradict some of Mark's work. But I think there is a, a synthesis that can actually um, happen here um, that, that could... Uh, maybe improve it or make it more, more potent. Uh, yeah, I, I, think that, I don't think I would give a, and it, I don't think I would dispute the idea that as Christianity developed, that it wasn't kind of refined in certain ways. And certainly aspects of Jesus were emphasized and de-emphasized and so on. I mean, when people went into battle, they weren't yelling out, you know, turn the other cheek and, you know, I, I must divide a son from his father. <laughs> you know, uh, Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, when, when Christians were, were going into to battle, they weren't proclaiming... <laughs> You must turn the other cheek, all right? So theory is theory, but uh, people don't, don't live on, on theory alone. So Christianity was all about turning the other cheek, but Christianity is not a suicide pact. Even if it's not working or if it well, I think it's be... despicable, but not because it's like, oh, you're so close. You just took a wrong turn right, right. before hitting the destination. No, I, I think the whole thing is like... So Richard has no interest in going after Alex Jones's followers. Fucking despicable. Yeah. yeah, I'm not saying he's just so close to took the wrong turn. He, he literally totally misdirects people, and he knows better. And he misdirects them back into Democrats are the real... He, he does because he's had people on his show, and he says you can't talk about... Dude, that came out, that someone was on his show. And he I've seen people. multiple clips of things like that happening. My question remains, like, why are you assuming that he's going to, like, be like us or something? Like, not everyone has to agree with us. And He knows, he knows the truth, and he's misdirecting people into DR3, saying the Chinese... I, this man who thinks that QAnon is real, he knows the truth? <clears throat> he knows that Israel sh is something that should absolutely be talked about, not like a yeah. lot. He knows that the Jews are running all this. He's not, he cannot be so stupid to know that they don't have massive power, but he's saying it's the Chinese to everyone. Even if it's not working, still what he's doing is trying to misdirect people who, in his mind, you know, are people who are into, you know, uh, uh, finding the truth. Yeah, he's also um, a very, very devout, serious Christian. And he, I, he, I know he married and had a child with a Jewish woman. I think she divorced yeah. him. I believe he remarried another Jewish woman who is also now divorcing him. Didn't he like oh, remarry yeah, a stripper wow. or something? Well, they don't like a, I don't know. I just, wasn't it, did he ever marry? Like I don't know. Like left his wife or uh, I, whatever. It doesn't matter. But I'm just I don't like, think that was. Uh, I, like, I'm not really about Alex. Let me say something that might reinforce a little bit what Richard's trying to say. You know, I um because I think maybe Dylan um what you're, sorry sorry I, I, I re reading my mic. But anyway, um I think what Dylan's getting at is that um you know if Alex would just go one step further, we could really red pill all of his audience and this like kind of the red pill enormous thing. A lot of these people like they um you know I, I've been noticing I've been posting in the chat lately like COVID stuff is getting hot again on the right and on the DR. Um, even, I mean, Joe Biden himself even said the pandemic was over last month. It's just like no one on the left is really even talking about it anymore. And yeah. um, a lot of the people that were former Alex Jones listeners that used to talk about the globalists and all this stuff um, became like Trump voters. And then they became like um, a lot of those became QAnon believers. And now that that's kind of gone, I mean, like the COVID thing is kind of like the new thing. It, it, it's just like I'm noticing this tendency on the right where they just have to find a losing issue that's righteous. And I mean, like, really, right. it's not much different than the conservative thing that we all identified and laughed at five, six years ago. But I mean, like, and, and I think it comes down to Christianity. Like, they just have to go and die on that cross. They just have yeah. to go and find something to nobly die for that's a righteous cause, but they just have to lose. They just have to lose. And so, like, like Alex Jones' whole thing is, like, there's this mighty, powerful cabal that's controlling everything. And, I mean, like, when you really break it down, it's really, like, demoralizing. And it's like, well, shit, I mean, like, even if this, which I don't think it's true, but, I mean, even if it is true and all the stuff he's saying, like, these, like, the vaccine is a Bill Gates bioweapon and, like, all these people are going to be infertile, they took it. I mean, like, if this is true, it's like, shit, man, I mean, how are we ever going to win? Right, yeah, you know, that's true. Like, that's, yeah, and, and like, I think that's the esoteric yeah. message that, like, um, like, like of a, a lot of the conspiracy lore, and I think it's what keeps a lot of the Alex Jones listeners going back. It's because, again, I mean, like, they just want to die on that cross. And I, I mean, like, that really gets to the thing that we're doing here is that, like, until you fix people spiritually, um, then, I mean, it's, you know, just talking about the Jews um, is not really going to um, get at the real problem. 
Well, yes. he kind of misrepresented my argument. I didn't say that he needs to just, he's so close, he needs to go one step further. I actually had written down in my notepad a while ago the problems that I see with Alex Jones. If everybody wants to check that but out. That, the, that is the, what you're saying, though, Dylan, because your, your argument you doesn't make sense unless, you, unless we assume that he has some great audience that we, we want to or something. Like, I see him as a shit magnet. Yes. You know, like, I yes. don't, like, that, if you try to capture those people, they yes. are going to turn you into them. And, okay. like, forget his audience. He, he, yeah. just, he so just divorced the audience. These lost people. Well, the divorce the audience. Watch. Divorce the audience from it. Magnet. What he's doing, even if he doesn't have a good audience that we want, is still. Okay, this this guy, Della, is just has the worst ideas. Whenever he shows up on Richard Spencer's phone conversations, he's just always coming with the wackiest stuff. So he wants the alt right to go after the Alex Jones crowd. And Richard Spencer's absolutely right there. Alex Jones attracts the worst people. The worst. I mean, they bring their problems with them. They bring drugs. They're criminals. They're rapists. And and some, I assume, are good people. But we really don't want the Alex Jones crowd. All right, I just read a terrific book, Chums, How a Tiny Cast of Oxford Tories Took Over the United Kingdom. As an independent variable. And you see that in the current furore among the private school cast about their weakening grip on Oxford entry, Oxbridge entry. And lots of those parents are now thinking, well, why am I paying 20 grand a year in school fees for my child if it's not buying them a place at Oxbridge? So in short, Eton without Oxbridge is worth a lot less than Oxford Eton plus Oxbridge. And Cambridge. And Oxford in particular is possibly the key step on the route to British political power. In fact, you can tell the story of modern British politics almost without reference to any other university. And I argue that if Johnson, Michael Gove, Dan Hernan, Dominic Cummings and Reese Mock had got rejection letters from... So 11 of the last 15 British prime ministers are graduates of Oxford University. Oxford, age 17. They probably wouldn't have ascended to their later positions of power. And so Britain would be a different country today. You know that Oxocracy is not new. 11 of the 15 post-war prime ministers went to Oxford. So how has Oxford captured the British political machine? With what consequences? And what could we do about it? Well, why does Oxford produce all these prime ministers? Mostly it's because of the prestige of the Oxford Union Debating Society. And in modern times, also the PPE degree, politics, philosophy, economics, and Oxford Cambridge, both of which tend to attract ambitious 17-year-old politicos to Oxford. Past presidents of the Oxford Union include Johnson, Ted Heath, Michael Foote, Michael Gove, uh, Theresa May and Harold Macmillan were both union officers, not presidents. Margaret Thatcher couldn't join because women were barred in her day, but she was president of Oxford University's Conservative Association. Now, every Oxford political cohort is different. And in the book, I distinguish roughly three political generations. And the first is high-born Oxford men whose formative experience was fighting in a world war. Harold Macmillan, for instance, June 1914, when he's 20, his CV looks a lot like the CV of the future 20-year-old Boris Johnson. Eton, you know, pretty upper-class background, plastics at Balliol College. Macmillan's just been elected librarian of the Oxford Union by two votes. He's a callow youth without a mission, raised in isolation from other Britons. But then in summer 1914, his CV and Johnson's diverge. Macmillan goes to World War One, is wounded three times, and even so, in 1916, he refuses his mother's suggestion that he apply. So Harold Macmillan was British Prime Minister in the 1950s and 60s, and he was asked what was going to determine the success or failure of his reign as Prime Minister, and he had a great response. He said, events, dear boy, events, right? Things outside his control, in large part, were going to determine whether or not his Prime Ministerial rule was a success. Events, my dear boy, events. I for a safe staff job. Seven Oxford Union presidents died in World War I, including three of the four who were in post between summer 1912 and summer 1913. So this is a class sacrifice by the ruling caste. Orwell wrote, Bertie Wooster, if he ever existed, was killed around about 1915. So Bertie Wooster's from the Ask Jeeves series. And the, the British upper class has, seems to have much more of a sense of collective responsibility has seems to have much more of a sense of obligation than the American upper class, or at least the American upper class we have now. So when America was a wasp dominated country up until the 1950s, then our upper class felt much more of an obligation to the rest of society. But since the fall of the Anglo-Saxon upper classes in America, our upper class now feels much less of a sense of noblesse oblige. But uh, the British in general, from the lower classes to the upper classes, walk around with much greater sense of obligation. So in America, the ethos is much more follow your bliss, you know, do what will make you happy, be all you can be, go for the gusto. In, in Britain and in Australia, 
life is much more about living with your mates and living up to your obligations. Macmillan said in old age that upper class officers such as himself, leading working class troops, I quote, learn for the first time how to feel at home with a whole class with whom we could not have contact, come into contact in any other way. So in the British tradition, a junior officer was responsible for his men's lives. So when these working class privates were killed, it was he who had to write letters to their mothers. And so it was a paternalistic, but a deeply responsible relationship. From 1940 through 1963, Britain is ruled throughout by prime ministers who had volunteered for the front in World War I, starting with Churchill, sacked from government after the disaster of the Gallipoli landings, becomes a commander of a battalion in the Royal Scots Fusiliers, 1916, he's 41 years old, goes off to Belgium where he's nearly killed. Other Oxford, well, Oxford men, Churchill obviously did not go to any university. Clement Attlee fought at Gallipoli, wounded in Mesopotamia, later again in France. Anthony Eden won a military cross for carrying back a wounded sergeant from no man's land under German fire. And two of Eden's three brothers were killed in the war. Three more Oxford Union presidents fell in World War II, and another, Ted Heath, won an MBA age 29 for his role in the Normandy landings. So for over 30 years, even very posh war veterans, Oxford men, had this formative experience of cross-class solidarity. And I think the closest Britain ever got to one nation was quite possibly in the trenches, even if the officers slept on beds and men on the ground, the men on the ground. And I think they really did feel. Right. So when you grow up in America, you have no sense of the sense of cohesion that European countries have. So England has always been a far more cohesive society than the United States. It's always had far higher rates of social trust and social cohesion. Australia has always had more social cohesion, social trust than the United States. And England and Australia have far less social trust and social cohesion than nations such as France and Germany and all the, the major European nations, Holland, Spain, the Scandinavian countries. And all these European countries, they've never had the social trust and social cohesion of a Japan or a Korea. They were all in it together. You just don't know what life is like until you live in a community where there's high social trust, high cohesion, and extraordinarily low crime rates, right? It, it just, it's just such a relief, right? People in America are much less comfortable because the rates of crime are so high, the rates of diversity are so high, you don't have very much in common with the people you interact with. And when you deal with the government in Australia or England, you have much more of a sense that the government's on your side. Therefore, people feel much more comfortable spending money on government services because it's going to people like them. In your interactions with the government in the United States, you're much more likely to feel like the government's the enemy. When you come into customs in the United States, you fly into the United States, uh, the the customs agents essentially treat you like the enemy. You fly into Australia or England, and if you're an English or Australian citizen, right, it's like, welcome home, mate, way to go. And it's no coincidence that the British era of war veteran prime ministers is also the era of Britain as a social democracy, approximately 1945 through 1979. And both eras end simultaneously with Jim Callaghan's defeat by Thatcher. By then, 1979, we're already into the second post-war cohort of Oxford leaders, the commoners, if you like, Harold Wilson, Heath, Thatcher, because from 1965 through 2005, the Labour Party mostly, and the Tory Party entirely, is led by people <coughs> who went to state school at the time that was felt that Britons would not vote for Tofts anymore. And then we get the third cohort, today's cohort, the people who've been running the country since 2010, the Cameron Johnson Gove generation. It's born in untroubled times. They're the most privileged members of the luckiest generation of a country that for over 300 years has avoided revolution, dictatorship, famine, civil war, invasion, or economic collapse. And yet these men feel a certain envy for their ancestors who had ruled Britain in more exciting times. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're born into the ruling class in the 60s or 70s, modernity had to feel like decline. Your fathers and grandfathers had run the world, and here you were growing up in a struggling mid-sized outpost of the European economic community. And Britain's tame, vegetarian, low-stakes, Brussels-based, post-imperial incarnation had nothing more glorious to offer these men than the Falklands War. And so some Tories of the Johnson generation actively craved tragedy. They longed for their own heroic project, but it took them a few decades to think of one. So let's go back to Oxford in the 80s. I suspect some of you here were there. I arrived aged 18 in 1988. Cameron and Gove had graduated that summer. Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer, who after doing an undergraduate degree at Leeds, did a Bachelor of Civil, War, Civil Law, not Civil War at Oxford, they both left simultaneously in 1987. Johnson had been president of the union, as you know, as as Melina Mercury, while also building his future networks in the Bullingham Club. I think this is a photo that all of you will know it since being there. I think the copyright has been removed by the photographers. I joined the university newspaper, Charwell, where we were always making fun of an absurd 18-year-old Etonian who dressed like a Victorian vicar. Okay, so let's go back. This is a famous photo here of 
all, all the leading Tories. So you'll see David Cameron in this photo. You'll see George Osborne. You'll see Boris Johnson. All right, so let's have a look here. There's David Cameron, future prime minister. There's Boris Johnson, right? If you go to Oxford University, right, the odds are about 65% that you will join Britain's elite. Graduate from Oxford, two-thirds chance you will join Britain's elite. I joined the university newspaper, Charwell, where we were always making fun of an absurd 18-year-old Italian who dressed like a Victorian vicar. I wonder how many of you can recognize Jacob Rees-Mogg. Here he is, aged 18, how he has changed. And we mocked Dan Hanan, the future theorist of Brexit. Dominic Cummings arrived a year or two after me, and he mostly sailed beneath the radar. The so how did Oxford Cummings, shape these men? It's like the Steve well, Bannon in Britain. An ancient tendency. Right. And, Dominic Cummings was the, the architect behind Brexit, and he was Boris Johnson's main political advisor. British political culture, which is the overemphasis on rhetoric, the importance of speaking well. And now so the, the author talks about how going to Eton and Oxford trains you to join the rhetoric industry. So typically these elites... British elites go to Eton private school, then go to Oxford. They do a degree in classics, meaning Latin or Greek or PPE, politics, philosophy, economics. Then they go on to the rhetoric industry. They, they work, you know, writing editorials for the Times of London, uh, the Guardian, the, the Telegraph, the Daily Mail. And then they go into the ultimate rhetorical industry parliament and politics. And so they essentially lived their lives in these medieval institutions, Eton, Oxford, parliament. That particularly applies at Oxford to the art subjects, but especially in the 80s, most Oxford undergraduates did art subjects. And the tutorial system in particular overvalues verbal skills. So in, in Oxford in the 1980s into the 1990s, 80% of the students were taking degrees in the humanities. In the 80s? when Oxford was a much less professional university than today, as you're going to hear from Professor Gingrich. So if you look at world university rankings today, Oxford is now ranked number one. It's the, the number one research industry, research university in the world. It, it is just had so much money poured into it. It has harnessed it. It has hired the brightest minds. Oxford University hired our friend Nathan Koftis. All right. So Oxford has the brightest minds, the biggest budgets. It's now the number one research university in the world. In the 1980s, not so much. A tutorial would often go like this. Age of 18, you'd read out your pitiful but elegant essay, which you might have finished at 5 a.m. Your tutor would point out the gaps in your knowledge, and for an hour you would try and talk your way around those gaps. Bluffing your way through tutorials was considered an art. Charwell, the newspaper, once praised Simon Stevens, another Oxford Union president, and until last year, head of the NHS. They praised him as Oxford's most talented off-the-cuff tutorial faker. Now, of course, most tutors could see through tutorial fakers, they were idiots, but often they couldn't be bothered to stop him. If a tutor wanted to do no work and bluff his way through his degree, many 80s tutors felt that was his choice. I say his because men outnumbered women in 1980s Oxford by nearly two to one. So, no, Cambridge is the number two university in England, but Oxford is, is far and away the most powerful and the most prestigious. Essays were not expected to feature footnotes or original research. You just had to read bits of a few books, or if you were very pressed, one book, and lay out a bold, ideally counterintuitive argument showing that the conventional wisdom about the subject was all wrong. And the provocative essay style tended to come more naturally to men than to women. And elegant writers who could produce in a hurry and argue cases they didn't necessarily believe tended to get better degrees, or often got better degrees, than serious scholars who'd read all the texts and cared about nuanced complexity. And the essay style I learned at Oxford has turned out to be ideal preparation for newspaper columnism. And when I read The Economist, I see I'm not the only one. Among the small Tory political caste, then the union is also extremely important, and it worsens this emphasis on rhetoric. Because what does the union president do? They didn't make policy that affected students' lives. That was done by the student union and by the college's junior common rooms, which handled issues like rents or discrimination. And those roles tended to attract about budding Labourites like the Miliband brothers, Yvette Cooper, or Ed Balls. Now, Labour has an Oxford tradition, but a very different one. Historically, Labour people are not steeped in the union like the Conservatives are. Attlee, Wilson, and Blair never bothered with the union while at Oxford. Blair honed his communication skills elsewhere, in theatre and playing in a rock band. And by the 80s, you know, the era of this book, Oxford's actually, Labour's actually boycotting the union. So the union becomes a training ground largely for Tories like Johnson, Gove, and Rees-Mogg. So to understand the leading Conservatives today, you need to study the 1980s Oxford Union. So here it does is stage debates in, and hold uh, elections. Oxford. So it naturally encourages this focus on rhetoric. 2005. Like tutorials and like Oxford's social language of ironic banter, the union perfected the articulacy that enabled future politicians, pundits, and barristers to argue any case whether they believed it or not. You won union debates not by boring the audience with detail, but with carefully timed jibes, 
calculated lowerings of um, voice and ad hominem, or the ad hominem staff, sorry, think of uh, Johnson in the Commons yesterday uh, making his joke about Sir Beer Corner about Keir Starmer, change the subject always. The same went for winning union elections, which were held every term, invaluable practice for future politicos. So by the time union hacks finished university age 21, they were almost ready for the Commons. Oxford. There's one other very important thing with hindsight going on in Oxford in the late 80s, and that's the birth of a Eurosceptic movement. September 1988, which is two or three weeks before Rees Mogg and I start university, Thatcher, who had always been a good European till then, she'd been building the single market with the European Commissioner Jacques Delors, suddenly she realizes, hey, the single market is going to be accompanied by closer political integration. She doesn't like that. So she gives the Bruce speech, warning about a European super state exercising a new dominance from Brussels. And this Eurosceptic speech is a turning point, and it spooks the Oxford Tories of the day. Because ruling Britain is what they're going to do when they grow up. They've known that since they were eight. They're headed to Westminster, like you know the Etonians and Oxford men who rule Britain forever. And they don't want outsiders in Brussels muscling in. And so Tory Euroscepticism begins in part as a jobs protection scheme, like taxi drivers fighting back against Uber. One early Oxford convert to Euroscepticism was Patrick Robertson, a history undergraduate. He sets up a think tank called the Bruise Group, age 20, and he then abandons his degree to, um, you know, to help grow the Bruise Group, which becomes the first organized British opposition to the EEC, arguably. And within months, the group has attracted more than 100 backbench MPs. And when Thatcher is ousted as PM, pretty much the first thing she does is become its honorary president. Someone who would become even more significant than Robertson is a history student called Daniel Hannan. When John Major approved the outlines of the Maastricht Treaty, the federalizing Maastricht Treaty in late 1990, Hannan, who's a first year 18th student, 18 years old at Oxford, he's outraged. He thinks Britain is giving up its sovereignty. And so that December 1990, he and a couple of friends, one of them the future UK MP Mark Reckless, found the Oxford campaign for an independent Britain in a coffee shop on the Oxford High Street. And it soon becomes the university's biggest political society after the union, the CIB as it's called. And with hindsight, the CIB looks like the genesis of the Brexit campaign. And Hanan in 1990 is Karl Marx in 1848, the theorist who sketches the paradise to come. And while at Oxford, Hanan was always inviting Eurosceptic MPs up from London to speak. And when he graduates in 1993, he helps set up the European Research Group at Westminster, which we have all read a lot about these last five years, and he becomes its first employee. So while everyone else is watching the news cycle, Hanan then spends the next 25 years keeping his eyes on a bigger prize. So the Oxford Tories come down to London, and what can they do? Rhetoric. So where do they go? Into journalism, my profession. Johnson was sacked from the Times for making up quotes, but got hired by the Telegraph by editor Max Hastings, whom we met when Hastings spoke at the Union during Johnson's presidency. Gove and later Hanan became journalists too. George Osborne tried, but was rejected both by the Times and the Economist. David Cameron also had an interview at the Economist. Cameron did a stint at the Conservative Research Department, but then he too goes into the rhetorical sector, running public relations at the media company Carlton. But from the start of their careers, their target is the senior branch of the rhetorical sector, Parliament, the ancestral home of the boarding school caste. Cameron, Gove and Johnson get there in the early 2000s. But at this point, Oxford Tories are still looking around for their political cause of their generation. They need a cause. They've got nothing like empire or world war or even Thatcherism. And one of their problems is that Thatcher, their heroine, has already actually fulfilled most of their political desires. She's a very rare politician who completes her project. And by the time she goes, she's privatized and cut taxes so far that you can't really take that project any further if Britain is going to remain a recognizable Western country. So the Johnson generation of Tories starts off without an obvious mission. But nobody cares about them anyway during Blair years, because Labour seems to have usurped usurp the, the role of permanent ruling party. And Oxford Tories in this time are competing against Britain's longest period of economic growth in 200 years. Tories finally get back into government in 2010, and they get to know Brussels. Because if you're a British minister, you're always on the Eurostar to Brussels, you go to the ghastly uh, modernist European quarter, and you sit in endless meetings, listening to the Latvian environment minister bang on about plastic bag use. And so that's a big come down. If you're one of these Tories that's very depressing, you're living the UK's post-war descent from very well alone of 1940 to qualified majority voting. Brussels is all about laborious consensus building, not elegant adversarial jousting. It's full of technocrats who speak this ugly globish. And for Oxford Tories, it's the opposite of the witty, ancient gentlemen's club of Westminster. And importantly, Brussels sometimes tries to tell Britain what to do, and that offends the sense of personal entitlement that men of this caste grow up with. Nobody tells boarding school and Oxford men what to do. Rules were for other people, and we've seen that with Partygate this week again. In their private lives, in their financial dealings, and at Westminster, these men expect maximum freedom. Cameron calls the Brexit referendum, and here it is, Brexit, the grand cause that Johnson and Gove had lacked all their political careers. It would give them a chance to live in interesting times, as their ancestors had. It would raise the tediously low stakes of British politics. The Oxford Tories could reclaim parliamentary sovereignty from the Brussels intruders. And beautifully, Hanan had spent a quarter century sketching out how exactly Brexit would work, what trade arrangements would be, and so on. So he was able to give Oxford tutorial level plausible sounding answers to all the boring technocratic questions that uh, whiners would sometimes ask. In private, many senior Brexiteers understood that Brexit might not work out, but who cares? Britain had no natural predators, 
and would survive even a blunder and aircraft certainly would. Even more personally, the leading British leavers in early 2016 were not having the careers they expected. In part, they treated the referendum as a kind of Oxford Union presidential campaign for grown-ups. Brexit is often called an anti-elitist revolt. More precisely, it was an anti-elitist revolt led by an elite, a coup by one set of public schoolboys, Oxford public schoolboys, against another, backed by an Australian Oxford public schoolboy media magnet. And in fact, this is important. Many vote leave, many voters were willing to entrust vote leave with the national future precisely because vote leave was led by a reassuringly traditional elite. Johnson and Gove had these reassuring Oxford credentials that gave Brexit more credibility. Farage would never have done it on his own. People wouldn't have voted for it, not enough. But Johnson's CV, confidence in classical tags, suggested that he was more than just a funny man, he was a man of weight. In British terms, this Etonian and Oxford figure seemed born to rule. And if this man was telling people that, quote, the cost of getting out would be virtually nil, or if Gove said, the day after we vote to leave, we hold all the cards, then surely Brexit couldn't just be a hazardous leap into the unknown. So the Oxford Tories strike a shake, the Brexiteers strike a shaky cross-class alliance with Farage, they never like him, but he recruits support beyond the Tory base. But vote leave's problem is that ordinary voters were never very interested in parliamentary sovereignty. Perhaps people didn't care very much, whether they were ruled by an out of touch elite in Brussels or ditto in Westminster. So Cummings focused the Leave campaign on two issues that most Britons did care about at the time, immigration, of course now Ghana's a political issue, and the NHS. And with his Oxford home rhetoric, he found the perfect three word slogan. Johnson in particular fought the referendum like a union debate with funny, almost substance free hot air. In England, humor is used to cut off conversations before they can get boring, emotional or technical. Hence his famous line on leaving the EU while keeping all the benefits of the single market. My policy on cake is pro having it and pro eating it. In 2019, he won a Tory leadership election in which six of the last seven candidates were high caste white men who studied art subjects, PPE or law at Oxford in the late 80s or early 90s. But almost immediately, his cabinet was hit by a problem for which Oxford had not prepared them. Suddenly, Oxford Tories had to confront questions of biology, statistics and exponential growth. Britain does have great scientists, engineers and quants, but they're stuck in the engine room while the rhetoricians drive the train. Modern Oxford specializes in producing politicians, civil servants, lawyers, accountants and pundits. I'm one of them. And these people, including me, typically drop science and maths age 16 and acquired only a smattering of economics. Once Johnson started paying attention to the virus, his instinct was to avoid lockdown. And that's what the Tory writes, Oxford, Oxford right-wing journalists like James Dellingpole, Toby Young, Julia Hartley Brewer were telling him what he undoubtedly would have been saying in the Telegraph if he hadn't been PM. They said, don't lock down because this cast has grown up expecting maximum personal freedom. The World Health Organization declared a global pandemic March 11th, 2020. Johnson kept the UK open until March 23rd. And a report by two House of Commons all party committees last October called the government's initial strategy of pursuing herd immunity and the consequent late lockdown one of the most important public health failures the UK has ever experienced. Now, this wasn't a one-off disaster. It was the British state's fourth major policy blunder this century after the Iraq war, the financial crisis and Brexit. And like the previous disasters, it had its roots partly in the privileging of rhetoric over facts and expertise. In 2002-03, it was Blair's articulacy that solved the Iraq war in Britain. When he hinted that Saddam Hussein's imaginary WMD could hit the UK in 45 minutes, the generally unscientific ruling class mostly believed him. Then the financial crisis hit Britain especially hard, largely because London's financial sector was so big. For decades, the semi numerous political elites had treated the city as a magic money tree, whose demands always had to be granted because Lord knows how the thing actually works. But in 28, 2008, the tree fell over and hit the country. And then we had Brexit and the COVID-19 slaughter. Germany, to cite one possible benchmark, either avoided or mitigated at least three out of the four disasters. We now know that while ordinary Britons were locked up at home, the rule makers went on a bullying esque tear of rule breaking. You might think it's insane for Johnson to risk his premiership over some of his booze ups, but again, and I think this is a key to understand Johnson, his cast expects maximum personal freedom. So what is to be done? Oxford has become a much more professional university than it was in the 80s. Most tutors don't tolerate articulate bluffers anymore. Students work much harder than they did in my day. Uh, many final exams are being reformed away from the old three essays in three hours format that favored the quote natural essayists. And just in the last three or five years, there's even been some reform of admission. Several triggers have belatedly embarrassed Oxbridge into doing something about Brexit, about privilege. There was the anti-elitist strain of the Brexit uprising, and then Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and the improvement of British state schools. And now Oxford, Oxbridge colleges aim for contextual admissions, taking account of the disadvantage that candidates might have surmounted to reach their academic level. So there has been a big advance. In 2000, private schools still supplied about half of Oxford's domestic intake. Last year, that was down to 32%, which I think is the lowest figure on record. So 68% state schools. And Johnson's old college, Balliol, had only one Etonian among its 137 freshers. But of course, the main beneficiaries of Oxford's new entry system are not the British working classes, not the mass of the population in general, I'm not saying the mass is working class. The beneficiaries are largely upper middle class people who went to state school. And even now, much of Oxford remains as it was in the 80s. The outsized role of rhetoric, the tutorial system, the union survive, remain important. And despite the recent advances, I don't trust Oxford to reform itself. For centuries, its role in the British system has been to funnel privately educated boys from school to power. 
but it could be different. In January, the elite French postgraduate training school, the Ecole Nationale d'Administration, was formally abolished. ENA, educated four of the last six presidents, including Macron, is not exactly dead. It's now become an institute for public service that aims to be more meritocratic and efficient. The hope is that it will no longer be just a place where the French elite reproduces itself. Well, Britain could do something like that with Oxbridge. My suggestion would be to keep what's best about these universities, but stop them teaching undergraduates because that would remove Oxbridge's biggest distortion of British power structures. And I also feel that the undoubted excellence of much of Oxbridge is wasted often on 18 year olds, typically from the most privileged British backgrounds who have other things on their mind than study, as I did when I was 18. Oxford and Cambridge themselves might benefit from the change. Uh, they currently lose money, I'm told, in every British undergraduate they teach. The tuition fee doesn't nearly cover costs. They ditch undergraduates, so they could focus entirely on research, teaching grad students, forming tech companies, and making ever more money from corporate conferences and executive education. But above all, most importantly, we could reform Oxbridge so that it educates more excluded Britons. How about you're 37 years old, you didn't go to university the first time around because of where you come from or because your life wasn't in that place at the time, but you are very bright and passionate about learning something. Oxbridge will find you and bring you in, whether it's for a summer or three years. Let's retrain gifted but underqualified adults. Let's expand these summer schools for promising disadvantaged teenagers. Oxbridge for all could raise a lot of people's sights. So absolutely, let's keep the excellence that there is in Oxbridge, but let's spread it much more widely. You might argue that a new set of elite universities, perhaps your university and UCL, would simply replace Oxbridge. Well, it hasn't happened in countries like Germany, Canada, Sweden, or Australia, where they've never really believed in elite universities. Other British Okay, I think that'll do it for tonight. Thanks for indulging me. I was just showing uh, pictures of my trip to Israel in year 2000, my trip up the coast of California in 2001, Monterey and uh, Big Sur, my trip to England and Oxford University in 2005, and uh, also hitting the Champs-Élysées in Paris. But uh, yeah, this is this is modern Oxford. So Oxford, the town, is actually quite ugly. But there's about a square mile where Oxford University is headquartered, which is absolutely gorgeous. So that's it for tonight. Take care. Bye-bye.